welcome to Senior Mamas. We're here at the Senior Center on Berry Street in Montpelier. And this is the second class of Bach by Eric Nielsen, my favorite composer. Johann Sebastian Bach's early career, he bounced around a lot. Uh, when he was 18, he started uh, with a, a job that involved a lot of menial, not non-musical tasks, as well as playing organ um, in the Duchy of Weimar. Um, in uh, 1705 and six, uh, he, um, or sorry, he only stayed there for, for seven months. And then he went and spent three years uh, in Arnstadt. And that is the first period in which he starts to show pretty much a career-long um, predilection for having disagreements with his employers. Like a lot of composers, he um, chafed under authoritarianism. The only one at all in this period of from about 1700 to about 1850 who actually got along quite well in that position was Haydn. But Mozart got literally booted down the front steps of the Archbishop's Palace in Salzburg. Literally. Yes. Uh, as he put it, kicked out on my arse. Um, and Bach had many difficulties, um, and that's to say nothing of, of Beethoven, who insulted patrons left, right, and center, and then would always apologize afterwards. For Bach, the difficulty was that in 1705-06, he um, received a leave of absence for four weeks to go to Lübeck to hear Dietrich Buxtehude, who was not just a well-known organist, but um, one of the primary composers of the Middle Baroque in Germany. And Bach wanted to learn firsthand, rather than through just looking at scores, what he was about. And so he went, but he stayed for four months. And so he got in big trouble when he came back. I think he even spent a little time in jail over it. Um, the difficulty was that it was over 500 miles round trip, and he walked all the way. So uh, he probably wore out his shoes several times. But in any case, um, that made it difficult for him to stay there. And so in 1706, he went to Mühlhausen. Um, and he stayed there for three years. During that period, uh, he married um, his first wife, Barbara, in 1707. And then in 1708, he went back to Weimar, but this time he took the position of being Kapellmeister, an organist. So it was much more about music and much less about tutoring children in Latin. Um, and uh, here he had a very good professional instrumental ensemble and a good organ. Uh, they set up house, and two of his composer sons, uh, Wilhelm Friedemann and uh, Carl Philipp Emanuel, uh, were born there. And what I did not realize was that Carl Philipp Emanuel's godfather was Georg Philipp Telemann. And uh, so they, uh, all of these people were quite collegial. Um, Telemann, Handel, Bach, they all either got together or wanted to. Bach and Handel kept missing each other. They never actually met in person. But they certainly knew of each other and knew of each other's music. Um, <laughs> Everybody admired uh, Buxtehude, um, and in fact, uh, the German composer Matheson and Anne Handel both came at the same time to visit and to see him. Right, it was close to the same time that Bach came to see Buxtehude, and Buxtehude wanted to retire, and he offered the position to both of them. But the condition, which was less unusual than I thought. The condition of employment was that the successful um, organist had to marry Telemann's oldest daughter. <laughs> so they both said, thanks, but no thanks, and they both left. Um, I had heard that, um, I had read somewhere that Telemann actually accepted that, but that's not true either. Um, in any case, Bach wasn't offered the position. so. Um, a lot of his work, a lot of Bach's work in Weimar and in his next appointment, which was at Anhalt-Kirchen, 
uh, which together they lasted from 1708 to 1723. Uh, so from his early to mid 20s all the way up into his late 30s. Both these were fairly secular posts. Um, there was not the emphasis on uh, writing for uh, church services that there was later when he was in Leipzig at the Thomaskirche. Um, he did write cantatas. He did write sacred music. A lot of his um, spiritual leanings went into his organ music, where he composed a great number of chorale preludes and other works. But this is the period in which he does a lot of work on um, instrumental music. So this is the period in which he wrote his Brandenburg Concerti, his orchestral suites, a lot of his sonatas for uh, solo instruments, duets, trios, um, as well as and keyboard music, solo keyboard music, meaning harpsichord or clavichord, as opposed to organ music, which he also wrote uh, in, in great profusion. It's not that he didn't write uh, cantatas and other sacred music during this time, and in fact, we'll listen to a cantata in a few minutes, but a lot of his emphasis was on instrumental music. So in his first year in Weimar, 1708, he produced a tremendous amount of music, and included in that was uh, two different uh, violin uh, sonatas for violin and keyboard. And we're going to hear the one in, um, in E minor right now. And this is done on period instruments. So this is a Baroque violin that you're going to see uh, and, and a harpsichord. So uh, here is uh, Jennifer Roig Francoli and Vivian Montgomery playing Bach's uh, sonata in E minor.
You'll notice that the free virtuosic prelude or introduction is followed by a slow movement rather than a fast movement.
There are several things that I would like to point out about that. First of all, you will notice how far up on the bow she was holding it. That's Baroque technique. It's so there's not too much pressure. It's much, about, much more about being light on the strings. You'll also notice there was almost no vibrato on long notes at the ends of phrases. It's a very straight tone. At least that is the received wisdom these days, and has been for about the last 20 or 30 years, that it's a much lighter sound, and that in this case, I think there's been a lot of research done reading contemporary texts about technique and how you were supposed to express the music. You also have to realize that there are no dynamic marks written, and that's because music was very local. So if Bach wanted somebody to play more loudly, he would say, okay, when we get to this place, play more loudly. So, and he would often be the person accompanying on the keyboard, although he was also a skilled violinist. Another thing to note is that pieces like this, sonatas like this, or partitas, or any of the other multi-movement forms of this era, going back to the late Renaissance and forward into about 1740 or 1750, are very different from the sonatas and multi-movement pieces that came afterwards. There's no sonata allegro form, there's no rondo form, there's no AABA, there are none of the forms that Haydn and his contemporaries invented and that went on for another 150 years. Instead, what you have are collections of shorter movements based on dance forms for the most part. So that last movement was a jig, or in English, a jig. Six A D yada da 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 dum ba da da yada da da. Another thing you'll notice is that the melodies are constructed of small rhythmic groupings that are then repeated in what's called a sequence, where you have yada da 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 dee 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 dee. You know, and where that's how the melody is constructed, and whole movements are made out of that, as you could hear. So it's a very different format. Um, from what we are used to listening to Mozart and Haydn and Beethoven and Brahms and Schumann and Mendelssohn and Chopin and all those other composers from the mid-18th century right through to the 20th and into the 20th century because there were composers like Vaughan Williams and Shostakovich and a number of others who used these forms still in the 20th century and some used them in the 21st. But before that period, during Bach's lifetime and before that, you had free sorts of movements like toccatas or canzonas, which are pretty free form. You get to improvise and then write it down. And others that are based on the rhythm of folk music, that is 6-8 for gig or something else, but not necessarily on the melodies, although a lot of times they were based on hit dance tunes, La Folia which was written in the 1400s, was a popular tune to make variations out of from then right through the 18th century. It just never lost its popularity. Not two weeks on the top 40 and then off. So this is the sort of thing that we can get used to. Yes, Nan? I, I was wondering if the balance between the two instruments was what you expected, because I heard so much, I heard hardly any of the keyboard. Yeah. Part of that was the miking. This is not a very well mic'd performance. You can hear all the echo in there, and uh, it wasn't as loud as I would have liked, but I had the volume on maximum. This is a, a uh, this looks like a single manual harpsichord. If you wanted more volume, you would get a bigger harpsichord with two manuals, that is two keyboards, and do a lot with the coupler. Whereas you would play on one keyboard, but they would both be operating. It's the same thing that you get on an organ. And that boosts the volume. But these are little tiny strings, and they're, and they're plucked. And there's nothing you can do about the volume. So, um, so it wasn't supposed to be. It was, it was supposed to be very strong. It was written. To, the, to understanding, the, the understanding was that the keyboard was going to give what it gave. Mm -hmm. and. The violin would do its best to balance, but the violin was the prominent instrument. You have to understand also that a sonata like this could be accompanied by some other instrument as well. You could have a cello or a viola da gamba or something like that playing the bass line 
in single notes and the keyboard filling out the chords. Because all Bach or his contemporaries would write for this would be a bass line with little numbers underneath and the player would be expected to know how to harmonize based on those numbers. It was a skill that they had. So a lot of the music of this period was, what did you have available? Did you have a bassoonist? Well, he could play the bass line, and then you'd get somebody to play harpsichord, and that would give more volume to the accompaniment. Mm -hmm. Did you want to repeat the name of the band? Jig, G-I-G-U-E. Oh, okay. Jigu, <laughs> or Jig in English, J-I-G. Yeah, okay, okay. Bernice. A little bit. And some are more different still. There are some earlier violins that, for instance, have a flatter bridge so that they can play multi note, uh, you know, uh, what are called multi stops, like a double stop or a triple stop, and hold the notes instead of having to roll over them because today's string instruments have a rounded bridge. So, unlike a guitar, you can't hold more than two notes without letting go of one. Some of the Baroque violins have a flatter bridge so you can do more with it. Um, we are going to hear a violin concerto, the famous double violin concerto, the D minor, at the end of the class. And in that, the two instruments are actually period instruments, but they're more modern violins. They are Stradivarius, both of them. So it's quite interesting. Sacred music. We can't go very far with Bach without getting back to it. He took many, many, many old chorale tunes. It was his stock and trade. It was his uh, home language, if you will. And one of them that he said in a number of different ways at a number of different times is an old Lutheran chorale tune for Christmas called Nun komm der Heiden Heiland. Now come thou, thou uh, wonderful savior. And the tune itself goes like so. And in the 16th century, that would have been harmonized very, very simply. Now, in my trusty little book of 371 Bach chorales, there are two different settings of this. I'm taking the simpler one, but I want to show you something about the ending that is quite, I think is quite interesting. So um, with my handy dandy homestyle chicken noodle soup <laughs> cans, at very high tech, holding up the, the the book, I will do my best here. Before I get to the last phrase, I'll play you a, quite a simple harmonization, and then I'll play you Bach's harmonization to show you the difference. Okay, now here's Bach's harmonization. Bach took these tunes, he would ornament the tune, but basically he made it so it was very recognizable. With the alto tenor and bass parts, he was a master, a wizard at being able to do tremendous things uh, to make all of those parts alive and interesting and melodic in their own right, 
And he played around a lot with different harmonizations. And when we get to the St. Matthew Passion in a number of weeks, he uses the same chorale over and over and over again, but he harmonizes it differently each time. So in any case, we're going to listen first, very briefly, to one of the uh, chorale preludes. And when I say brief, this is a real short one. And that's quite a simple setting of it. You can really hear the tune. There's ornamentation around it. And now we'll hear the cantata BWV 61 based on this in basically the same format as the cantata that we heard last week. That is, there's a chorus at first that sort of sets it out in ornamented fashion. Then you have different solos. And then we finish off with the chorus again in a chorale. And this is with Nicholas Arnoncourt. Uh, conducting the Consentus Musicus of Vienna and the Arnold Schoenberg Choir. He's already changed the melody, he put in a sharp there in the second and the third note.
It's amazing how ornamented that was in the instruments.
You'll notice that was a da capo aria. That is, he went back to the beginning, com Jesu com. And you'll notice also how familiar it is in the poem. Isn't that fascinating? It's all about opening the door. And the strings, they're knocking. light touch with the Boeing.
Now, wasn't that an unexpected ending? <laughs> they started by singing, oh, man, oh, man, you figured it was going to be a great big ending, and instead it just faded away. So it's easy to think that of his 200 or so sacred cantatas that they would be sort of stamped out. You know, he had to write one a week when he was in, in, in Leipzig. But in fact, he invests them within the generalized form that he uses with all sorts of individuality based on his interpretation of the text, whether the text was by Luther or one of his contemporaries, as in this case, or one of Bach's contemporaries. And you can tell by this text um, how the early Lutherans, at least, viewed Jesus as somebody with whom they could be familiar. So it's not common Z, it's com Jesu com. That is the familiar, du, not Z. Second person singular, which is, you have to be on good terms in Germany or Austria to be able to use the du form. And in the tenor solo, that's what you're hearing. Come, Jesus, come into your church. And so, it's this joyous invitation, and Bach certainly sets it that way. So, and then the next um, recitative of the bass about knocking, hearing the knock and wanting to, and opening the door, and you hear the strings plucking away, and that's some word painting. You're really setting that in such a way that you can hear the knocking, and and then it's often hard to tell in Bach's sacred works. There are two forms of, of do that are used, one in talking to God and the other in talking to your own heart. Do mine hearts. You, my heart, be open to this. So I, I think it's a wonderful example. And the, the final chorale is not one that would have been sung at least easily by the congregation because it's an amen. And so there's almost no trace of the original chorale tune in it. So it would not be something that on Sunday they would get up and say, oh yeah, we can just sing through this. <clears throat> when Bach wrote instrumental music, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, he would use different types of dance forms. And nowhere is this more uh, apparent than in his suites for solo keyboard instrument. And he wrote two rather sizable <coughs> Um, collections that came to be known as the English Suites and the French Suites. Now, the English Suites were so named in the 19th century. There's nothing particularly English about their music. It was based on a misunderstanding that Bach somehow uh, was writing them for someone in England, but there's no evidence of that, nor that he was writing for a French virtuoso uh, who traveled to England a great deal. So. At least it's one way for us to differentiate the two sets of suites. But when I say rather sizable, there are six English suites. Each one of them is about 15 minutes long or more. So you're talking about over an hour and a half of music in, in each of these. And they follow a very um, a fairly set pattern, which is that you have a, a, a prelude, an introductory movement, and then what you have is a, a set of particular dance movements. And in this case, in the case of the suite number three in G minor, there's the prelude. And then there's an alleman, which is the French term for a German dance. Uh, courant, which was originally a Spanish dance, a sarabande. And then in this case, two different gavottes. Now, a gavotte is a more ceremonial dance. And then finally, a gigue. And we're going to hear it on piano, not on harpsichord. And the reason that I chose that is because the player, Andras Schiff, is one of the foremost keyboard interpreters of Bach's music alive today. He uses no pedal on the piano. And his touch is brilliant. So we will listen to as much of it as I can squeeze in, because I have another good-sized piece to play for you at the end of the class. So we might not get to all of it. So I'm apologizing in advance if that's the case. And you'll notice it's almost all two notes at a time, right hand, left hand.
Now comes the Allemande.
can listen to the two gavots and the jig yourselves, but I need to tell you about 1717. <laughs> because it was, like 1708, a big year for Bach in terms of number of compositions, and like 1708, it was also a big year in terms of transition, because he left his position in Weimar. I should say he was um, asked to leave. He was dismissed. I'm not sure why. Uh, probably there was some sort of disagreement. Um, in fact, I know there was a disagreement because he was thrown in jail for protesting uh, the terms of his dismissal. And that was at the very end of the year. But in the meantime, he'd, he, had been, um, imp he had been engaged by Prince Leopold of anhalt Curtin to come and be his Kapellmeister. And so during that transition, he was still writing a lot of music and some of it sacred, and a good deal of it secular. And he wrote during that year two violin concerti, the one for single violin in A minor, and the one that we are about to hear. I've, I've included links for both of them, but this is the more famous of the two. They're both well known, but this is the more famous of the two, the D minor, so-called the Bach double. That's what string players call it. That's all they call it. This is the Bach double. Well, it's the concerto for two violins in D minor. And this particular performance is quite interesting because, as I mentioned, it's Arabella Steinbacher and Akiko Suanai. Uh, and you'll notice that they're not accompanied by an orchestra, but by five string players and a harpsichordist. So it's a very chamber ensemble version but you'll notice also the instruments that they are playing. One of them is playing Stradivarius from 1716, so just the year before this work was written, and the other, a Stradivarius from 1714. And this is, um, notice this is sponsored by a Japanese foundation. And in fact, a lot of the Cremonese violins, Guarneri, Amati, Stradivarius violins, are owned by banks and by collectors rather than musicians. And they loan them on a long-term basis to soloists. And the difference in sound is, is pretty striking from what I've been told between one of these old violins and just a, a middling new violin. There are some. There's some string players now who play new instruments that they like very much. Members of the Emerson String Quartet, for instance, um, use instruments um, created by a luthier in Boston. So it's not just that people have to have these Criminese instruments. Uh, that is from Cremona. It was this group of three. Uh, master uh, Amati and his two students, Guarneri and Stradivari. Um, but uh, this is interesting that they are playing on these period instruments right around the time that this piece was written. So in any case, here it is, the uh, Concerto for Two Violins in D minor. And it will sound familiar. that happens in this.
just want to point out before we go on to the other two movements how typical this is of Baroque concerto writing. That is, there's a main melody and it will go oftentimes between the soloists. In this case, there are three choices because it can go back and forth between the two soloists, but also the ensemble will often pick up the melody and take it. So you could hear it, particularly in the lower instruments later in the movement. And so that's basically this alternating technique between the small group or the soloist and the larger ensemble is something that is very, very prevalent in this era, much more so than in later uh, music, uh, classical or romantic era music. Okay, second movement is after a vivace, very lively, is a largo ma non troppo, slow but not too much. And then that's followed by an allegro final movement.
Not bad, huh? <laughs> now, you will have no doubt noticed that this was quite a modern performance. That is, they used a full-length bow, modern bow, and though even though these were instruments built contemporaneously to that piece being performed, the technique used, especially in the slow movement, lots of vibrato. I, I'm, I have to confess that with all those long notes in the melody and the slow movement, I'm having a hard time envisioning how with a lighter bow and no vibrato that were a little vibrato that would sound. Um, I like this performance a lot, but it's not the same as an earlier um, use of, of technique that, that we saw before. May I assume correctly that you would for the most part, much rather see performers play than follow the music on the screen. Yes. Okay, I thought so. Fine. We need, for, for those of you who don't read music, it wouldn't make any difference to see this. Yeah. They, they showed us a little of it. That was good. Like yeah, that. yeah, a little bit to show that. I have a, I have a dish towel that has Bach on it. Uh, I'm not sure which particular piece, but they had subtitles with the music running along. Yes, that's right. Here's here's D. Here's yeah. E. Um, next week uh, we will go to one of the large instrumental cycles of Bach, his Brandenburg Concerti. Although we will only cover five, we will cover one of them. Number two, the following, uh, the first class in November for a very specific purpose. But uh, it ought to be an interesting class, so I hope to see you all next Friday.